Thank you, Mayor, Council, for your for this opportunity tonight to consider this this rate proposal. Um, I've got just a few introductory comments, and then I'm, I'm going to turn over to, to Jill Schutbach. She uh, is the was, was is with the consulting firm that we select to do this work for us. But uh, as CEO of Common Corp, this is probably the least favorite thing, least favorite part of my job. But it's necessary from time to time, and that's certainly the case tonight. You know, we last came to you guys uh, with an electric rate recommendation in 2017. Um, and at that point in time, it was to address some transmission expense increases. Pretty nominal at the time. Little did we know we'd have such dramatic increases just a few years later, um, six years later, uh, to be to be accurate. Um, and, and just to give you a little bit of background and some context behind the rate study, you know, the average market price for purchase power is $52.60 per megawatt hour. Uh, at the end of, of 2022, uh, and it was $30.08 at the end of 2017. So dramatic increases there. Um, supply chain issues with regard to transformers. Uh, they used to cost um, 167 kVA pan mount transformer. Used to cost us about $3,200. Now they're about $35,000, and not and they take uh, used to take about 12 weeks to get. Now they take over a year to get. So uh, also conductor, all the wire conductor that we purchase has doubled in price. Now that's not indicative of everything that we buy, uh, but it's certainly the trend for uh, for for a lot of our materials and supplies. And certainly we've experienced uh, you know uh, uh, inflationary increases like a lot of you guys have seen, and those are the things that have driven the need for uh, the rate study. You know we engaged uh, New Gen Strategy and Solutions about a year ago to help us with this. And again, Jill Schutbach will come after me and and go through the slides that we have uh, before you. Uh, and uh, I just want to. I just want to mention that, you know, I want to thank my staff that worked on this. We started on this about a year ago. Uh, many of them are here. Um, Aaron Brown, uh, Tracy Moore, who retired last Thursday, was a, was a big part of that. Uh, Bill Bethay, Crystal Kemp, Dale Gottspiner, they all were involved. We took a very comprehensive look at this to make sure we did it in as fair and equitable way as possible. One of the things that helped us, uh, I think, be more equitable in terms of the distribution of cost was all of our AMI data, automated metering infrastructure. We have a lot more of that. They never used to have, and so we incorporated that into the rate study. New GN was was able to take that data and make it real, um, and help us to make some really accurate conclusions as ter in terms of how we need to adjust our rates. Um, and so, uh, with that, I'll just I'll I'll, I'll close and just want to just say thank you guys for uh, your consideration, and hope you'll support the the rate uh, increase that we that our board approved back in May of 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Like our city employees, would you let your folks know we appreciate the job they did at sure. the storm? Would you let your folks know we appreciate the job they I did? I absolutely the will. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, as Brett. I get you to state your name and address, please. Sorry. My name is Jill Schubach. I'm with New Gen Strategies and Solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as Brett mentioned, the, we've spent the last year working on the electric rate study. Um, I'm going to walk through um, the process that we go through and why we go through it, um, what all of it means, and then at the end, the proposed rates we have. So there's three major steps in the process. The first one is the revenue requirement. What that means is how much money does the utility need to collect to pay its bills and maintain its cash reserves? So. For example, in the case of Conway, the system revenue requirement is $72 million. So Conway needs to collect $72 million through its electric rates and tariffs to get all the bills paid and maintain the cash in the bank. The next step is the cost of service. And what this does is this says, okay, at the system level, you need $72 million, but what is it by customer class? How much of that is being driven by residential or by um, large power or by lighting, et cetera. Um, and then we, at the end of that step, we know, okay, for $72 million, we know how much of that is driven by each class. And then finally, we look at rate design. This is where we're designing the rates that are on your tariffs. So what should the facilities or the customer charge be, the energy charge, the demand charge? And we set these rates to collect $72 million because that's what the utility needs. Um, another thing that comes out of the cost service pr uh, process, that middle step, is uh, what should the customer charge be? What are your customer-related costs? What are your demand-related re costs? What are your energy-related costs? So going through that process gives us um, like guidelines for how to set the rates when we do the rate design by customer class. 
So the first step was the financial forecast and revenue requirement. As Brett was uh, saying earlier, the last time the study was done was 2017. So it's, it's been five, six years since then. Um, we looked at the last four or five years of historical data and then looked at the projections. And there's a couple of big drivers that are causing the rate increase. One of them is operations and maintenance expense, which a lot of this is labor. Um, it's things that are used at the headquarters um, at any of your other facilities. And that has increased by 22% when you look at the historical average to the projected average. That does not include your power supply costs, um, which would be your fuel or any purchase power. Another thing that has increased quite a bit is the capital spending. And so capital spending is, this is your buying assets. You're building a substation, you're building lines, things like that. And that has also increased quite a bit since the last right study. That's gone up 28% looking at historical compared to projected. Um, we looked at a financial forecast through 2027. And we looked at, um, it's basically a cash flow or a cash analysis. We looked at what the cash reserves were. Um, so on the, uh, on the left margin, this is your cash in the bank in millions of dollars. So you can see in 2024, you're just over $20 million. As time goes on though, if there's no rate changes, you're depleting the cash in the bank because your rates are not collecting enough money to pay all of your bills, to pay your power costs, your O&M, your capital costs. So you're draining reserves just to operate. Um, and the utility does have a reserve fund policy or a day's cash on hand policy. Um, it's, it's generally historically been 25 to about 50 million. Uh, we're talking about it in terms of days of cash on hand. We want the days of cash on hand because that will vary as the expenses vary. Um, and so here what these lines are, the red line is your minimum. It's 150 days of cash on hand. The yellow line is what the projections are showing. So when you look at the yellow line compared to the red line, you can see the cash is dropping compared to your goals. The cost of service part of the study, this is um, where we looked at the we looked at the financial forecast, we came up with our revenue requirement, and we said, okay, the utility has a $72 million revenue requirement. These are the components of that revenue requirement. You can see the bulk of it is production or power supply. So it's gonna be your purchase power and your fuel. Um, there's also a lot of capital from cash. That's capital that you're paying from cash, not issuing debt for. Um, there's administrative O&M and some other things in here, but the total revenue requirement is about $72 million. Uh, next, we get into the rate design. And so let me back up a little bit before I get into the details of residential. Uh, when we do this cost of service study, we look at how much of your costs are fixed versus how much of your costs are variable. Fixed costs being things like you know labor and your headquarters and overhead and stuff like that that doesn't change. It doesn't matter how much power a customer uses, those costs stay the same. Your variable costs are like your fuel costs or your purchase power costs because every time a customer uses a kilowatt hour, that's going to change. Um, so when we go through the cost service study, um, one thing, and we see this consistently with, with other utilities also, is that the, there's a lot of fixed costs associated just with running a utility. You've got all the assets in the ground, you've got all the labor, all the management, um, you have a lot of fixed costs just to run the utility, whether people are buying power or not. When you look at rate design and you look at what the rates are collecting, the majority of the revenue is collected through variable rates, through your energy rate. So one goal as we go through this process is to improve your fixed cost recovery. We want, <clears throat> we want to improve the fixed cost recovery, which means the facility charge or demand charges for those classes that have demand charges. So as we go through each of these classes, you'll see we're making improvements with each of these classes um, with two things. One, moving them closer to cost of service, the cost to actually serve that class, and two, improving fixed cost recovery. So with residential here, you can see we have our current rates in that first column, and then we're phasing in the three rates. And we phase it in over three years because we don't want there to be any um, big shocks or, or um, any big impacts to the customers. 
So how the rates have been designed is that on average, they're gonna go up about 5% a year. And you can see on here, the average bill is just over 1,000 kilowatt hours a month. Um, so it's gonna go up about $4 a month. Um, the facilities charge, how, how we, there's a, there's a few ways we approached this. One was we looked at the facilities charge to improve fixed cost recovery. We, we increased that by a dollar each year. Um, so we've, in, we've improved our fixed cost recovery, but we're not making any big jumps. Uh, the other thing we did <clears throat> is we phased out the seasonal rate. You can see at the beginning with our current rates, we have a higher summer rate than a winter rate. And by the end, we have the same rate for all year. Uh, the PCA is it like a power charge adjustment. It's a pass-through. It's calculated based on whatever your power costs and fuel costs are. So that PCA um, here is an average annual, but with the utility, they can change that. And that PCA can reflect your seasonal costs and your seasonal rates. So that PCA can send the price signal to the customers. So by the end of these phased in rates, we've just got one energy rate on the tariff. Um, but that PCA, the way it's designed to function is it will send the price signal to the customer based on the costs at that time. Uh, so here for the residential class, you can see the average bill increases over the next three years, and on average, it's about 5% per year. Um, what that looks like, these are billing impact graphs, and so the height of the bar is how many customers it affects, and then on the horizontal axis um, is how much it affects those customers. So the graph on the left, you can see the dollar amount. Um, so if you look at that, the tallest bar is $3. So there's about 9,000 customers that are going to see an average bill increase between $1 and $3. On the right, it's on a percent basis. So you can see the bulk of those bars are right around 5%. Now these are different, obviously, because people use power differently. You know, it's very different, you know, for somebody like my mom who lives in a townhome who just watches TV, um, compared to, you know, me, I have six kids and pets and a mad house and we use a ton of energy. So we have very different profiles. So depending on how you use power, um, you're going to have very different, you can have very different results on these graphs of how this bill affects you. Um, this graph is a benchmarking and it shows Conway's rates compared to other utilities. So the current rate is the one on the very far left. And this would, this would be an annual, um, annual amount in your 12 months of bills. So the current rates for a year's worth of bills would be about $900. If you look at phase three of the rate proposal, you're closer to $1,100, but you're still well below everyone else in the area. Um, Conway has done very well at managing their rates and keeping their rates down. And even with this rate study and with these rates, these three rate phases coming in, they still have the lowest rates in the region and are very competitive. For large general service, um, here we have a facilities charge. We've, based on the cost service results, we've maintained that. The demand charge has increased. Uh, this is part of improving fixed cost recovery based on the cost service results. And overall, they're getting about a 2.5% increase per year. Large power service. Uh, here we've bumped up the facilities charge and the demand charge. They're getting about a 5% increase per year. And then for new rate designs, we've, we've looked at three new rate designs. Uh, one of them is for electric vehicles for residential customers. As more electric vehicles come into the area, uh, you're going to want a rate to serve them and also, most importantly, to help manage that load. I'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. The next one is electricity intensive loads. Um, we've seen this a lot in other states. This is where a company comes in and they're going to run a data center or they're going to do Bitcoin mining. Um, capital expenditures to serve these customers can be substantial. Conway recently just went through their line extension policy and updated it, which is very important, and it also helps manage the risk in serving these customers. 
And so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then economic development rates. This allows for Conway to contract um, with specific customers if they're going to bring new load into the system or help promote economic development. So for electric vehicle rates, the most important when designing these rates is to send the customer a price signal to charge their cars off peak. You don't want them to come home from work right when everybody's making dinner and everybody's cranking down the air conditioning and turning on the TV and go plug their car in because it's gonna drive up the utility's peak. And every time it drives up that peak, it costs the utility more money in general and then it costs everybody more money. So you want to manage when they're charging it. So we came up with an electric vehicle rate that promotes charging off peak, which is for the most part overnight. Um, another, another risk with them charging on peak is as they add the peak to those houses, it can, ca it can cause an upgrade of the system to be required. Um, you know, upgrading transformers, conductors, anything to serve that additional load. So this is um, an electric vehicle rate for you guys to consider. We've kept the facility charge for residential just the same as the standard residential class. But then you'll see there's an on-peak, mid-peak, and off-peak rates. The off-peak is at night, that's overnight. It's a little bit closer to the marginal cost of power. If you were to strip everything away and look at just what is my marginal cost of power to generate or buy it on the market, that's the price this is set at. Mid-peak is much closer to the class average cost of power. And then on peak is a little bit more expensive because remember we're sending this price signal that we don't want you to charge in the afternoon. We want you to charge off peak or mid peak if you have to. Before, uh -huh. before you move past EVs, that with a separate rate here, does that require a separate meter for an EV charger? So Conway does have AMI meters, but I think I think right now the meters can handle billing this, but I'm not sure the billing system can handle. Brett, you want to jump in? I think the billing system can't handle selling out the bills at this point, the, but the plan is to get a billing system that will. Yeah, thank okay. you. All right, electric intensive loads. So these are your data mining or your Bitcoin miners. Um, this looks a lot like our large general service rate because if they come in, that's likely the group they'd be in. Um, if they were bigger than that or smaller than that, you know, Conway could work with them on rates. Um, the, the important things here to consider if you get a load like this is if they are going to cause any costs on your system, you know, you have to build a substation or upgrade transformers or anything like that, you want the customer to pay for that. Um, some of these loads are really high risk. We, I have a client in Texas that had a big load come in. They said they're going to be 300 megawatts, double the size of the utility. And then they built everything out and they're at about 100 megawatts and they filed for bankruptcy. Um, so it, it can be really risky. So it's most important you know, for them to pay for their costs or you have some kind of contract written so that they're going to reimburse you for any line extension type of costs. Um, otherwise, you know, they just need to pay their fair share of the bills, their facilities charge, demand charge, and energy charge. Economic development, economic development rates. Um, this allows the utility to contract with customers. Um, a lot of times we'll see, we'll see this with big industrial customers that may come in and offer a lot of jobs, and so it's development of the community. I've also seen this done where they're trying to revitalize a downtown, and if somebody comes into the downtown space and opens a business, they'll get a discount because that's part of the goals of the, of the city council and of the area. Um, so, but, but what's important is that, um, one, you want to attract these customers to come in and bring their business. You want to offer them some type of discount to attract them, but you also want to limit the time period, you know, three years or five years or something like that. Um, another thing up here, it says the contract may include CIAC, that's contribution in aid of construction. That's what I was talking about earlier with the line extensions. If they're going to cause any big capital investment, you either want them to pay for it or you want to have some guarantee or some contract term to help the utility recoup those costs. Otherwise, your existing customers are going to have to foot the bill for that. Um, and most often, we see this in a reduced demand charge. Sometimes you can see it in reduced energy charge if you're collecting fixed costs through the energy charge. Um, but a lot of times, you'll see it in a reduced demand charge. 
And then finally, um, in conclusion, moving forward, like I talked about with that five-year forecast, your current rates are insufficient. Uh, they need to be increased for you to pay your bills and to maintain your cash reserves. There have been significant costs in materials and equipment and, and just in, in labor and benefits. Um, there is some subsidization among customer classes. That's why when we went through those rate changes, residential and large power service had the bigger rate increases because those classes are the most subsidized based on the study. Um, so as we go through these three phases of, rate, of rates, we want to move all of these classes closer to cost of service. Um, we also need to make sure we collect our $72 million of revenue to get our bills paid. And the fixed cost recovery should be improved, in, increasing those facility charges and increasing the demand charges. Um, for example, based on the cost service study, if a residential customer is attached to your system, whether they use power or not, it costs about $58 a month to serve them for the, from the utility. Because you guys have debt, you have labor, you have capital you're paying for. And you have this whole system built in headquarters and management and all of those things. So whether they use power or not, um, them just co connecting to the system is about $58 a month. So that's why we talk about fixed cost recovery a lot. So recommendations. Um, one, when, when you think about cash in the bank, try to start thinking about it in terms of days of cash on hand, because as you've seen, the expenses have increased dramatically. Um, and so six years ago, if I would have said, oh, we need 15 million in the bank, and then we got to this year, and it's like, oh, 15 million is not enough. <laughs> so if you can start thinking about that in the terms of days of cash on hand, rather than just a dollar amount, uh, that'll be helpful going forward. Um, I recommend the three-year phase in of rates. Make sure we collect enough revenue, maintain our reserves, uh, move towards cost of service, so to reduce any cost shifting among the classes and within the classes, um, improve the fixed cost recovery. And the, we have went through this, I think it was in May, with the board, um, and we answered a lot of questions, and the board uh, has approved the rate design and the recommendations. Um, so I am available for any comments or questions, or if you think of anything later and you want to email me, um, just let me know. My contact information is here. Council, any questions? What is the cost per day? What is the what? Cost per day right now. If we're supposed to think of it in terms of how many days, what is the cost per day? Um, I would have to look. We're... So the current policy is right around 25 to 50 million. And, and when we look at this on the 150, 180 days, it's, it's right in that range. Uh, but I would have to pull that number to tell you the cost per day. Any other questions? Thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you. Anyone else would like to speak for or against? Yes, sir. Mayor Castleberry and uh, members of the City Council, I, my name is Tom Courtway. It's my pleasure uh, to serve in my last year uh, on the Conway Corporation Board. It's my second seven-year term, and I'm the chair this year, and I'm here to uh, speak uh, in favor of this uh, proposal. Certainly, as Mr. Carroll said in his uh, introductory remarks, um, it's not something we take lightly. Uh, it certainly wasn't uh, my pleasure the first uh, meeting I had as chair of the board to have this right uh, proposal before us. So, uh, but we, uh, we looked at it. Uh, we all believe, uh, I believe we had one abstention because it was our newest board member's first uh, meeting, uh, but the rest of us were unanimous in endorsing this. Certainly believe, we believe it is uh, well studied. It's uh, well founded, it's prudent. Uh, and from a board, I mean, 48 years ago, I got my degree at Hendrickson Economic and Business. And when I walked across the stage to get my diploma, I hit the eraser button, button on statistics, accounting, and all that stuff. Just said, I like my degree, I forgot it. Some of this stuff is over my head. But what I do focus on is we need cash reserves in the bank and we need to increase them because this is unsustainable in the rate study, rates that we have now, number one. Number two, we have a great utility system here in cooperation with the city council and we have to continue to invest in our infrastructure and our personnel and I think that's what this provides for us for many years to come. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Corley. Thank you.
Mr. Mayor, Council, Brad Lacey, uh, 507 Locust. I'm supposed to say that, right? You are. And uh, tonight I'm coming on behalf of the Conway Development Corporation, the nonprofit economic development entity for the city. Uh, we are also in support of this. You saw an economic development rate. That is a very important tool that uh, Conway Corp has really never had. Uh, and as you know, economic development is uh, pretty active right now with West Rock and the investment they're making. Uh, you saw last week 600 additional jobs coming. Uh, those projects are often large. Uh, this rate will help Conway Corp recoup some of that cost, which I think is important. Uh, and also, we are growing extremely quickly. You know, we're the 63rd fastest growing city in America right now and the fastest growing city in Arkansas. And uh, we hope that uh, you, like us, want to continue that. So, would appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Lacey. Would anyone else like to speak for or against? We will declare this public hearing closed. Council, it's back to you. Before we start, I would like, Brett, I could, I could do this, but you can do a lot better than I can. Would you, for the benefit of everyone watching, explain the relationship between the City of Conway and Conway Corporation? Sure. In the fact that, the, fact that the municipality does not own Conway Corporation. Why don't you explain right. how all that works briefly? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, you know, there are a number of ways that uh, municipal utilities can, can serve their community. Um, sometimes the utility is part of city government. Uh, our city leaders uh, many years ago decided to make the corporation separate from city government. So um, in our particular case, we have a board of directors that, that I report to. Uh, we have a franchise and lease agreement for all of our, we have a, a franchise and lease, lease agreement for electric. We have one for our water systems. We have one for our telecommunications uh, services as well. And so um, the, you guys have delegated the authority of managing the utility system to the corporation. We're a private nonprofit corporation. Um, but you guys are a regulatory authority. So I report to the board, uh, and, and we, we bring any kind of recommendation to them, get their approval first, but then those recommendations have to come to the council as, as it relates to rate uh, increases, uh, rate studies, or, or if we issue debt, we issue debt in the name of the city of Conway. And so uh, that relationship has existed for almost 100 years now, and I think it's worked extremely well. And uh, and I, I can't take credit for any of it. I'm just trying to keep it going uh, in the direction that it's been all these years. And so I think it's a wonderful relationship. It's it's uh, we often uh, I, I've I've had the opportunity to serve on the American Public Power Association board of directors for the past four years. Uh, when I get a chance to talk to my colleagues across the the country, uh, when when we talk a little bit about the things that we do in Conway, our connection to education, that's a very unique part of it as well. Is our connection to education and then the unique part. That it, education plays in the development of our community, uh, they're 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 pretty astounded by the way that's all worked. So I don't know if did that answer your question, David. Much better than I could have. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, any other questions for me? By the way, that 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 you that that we didn't get to answer, yes, ma'am. Hi, Mr. Carroll. Yeah. I think if you could explain to me how if the if a crypto miner mm -hmm. company. Yes. were to try to come into Conway, yeah. it sounded to me like they would be responsible for paying for any new facility or any yes, all yeah. that. And yes, that should be pretty effective in keeping crypto miners out of Conway. Well, it but certainly, I think so. I think one of the reasons that crypto miners look in the state of Arkansas not just in Conway, but the state of Arkansas, is that our utility rates across the board in the state are relatively cheap. And the number one input into their product is electricity. You know, they've got just a, a, a building full of servers that are, that are running algorithms and calculations around the clock, and that's the number one input into their, into their, um, to their products and services. And so they want to be where electricity is as cheap as it can be. So, you know, uh, you, you heard Ms. Schutbach talk about the, the city in Texas where it, it doubled their load, they went to 300 megawatts. And so they, they tend to be very big users of electricity. And so what we want to do, what we've tried to do with the design of our line extensions uh, policies and our rates is that it, to the extent that there's significant capital improvements and there likely would be, they're, they're responsible for all those things. So, and they're very portable. They can be here and be gone relatively quickly. And so what we, and, and so if you're just relying on them being here 10 years to get your money back, that's a mistake. 
because they could be gone in a month. And so we've designed our policy so that we mitigate our risk as best we can if they choose to come to Conway. I think so. that's a good part. I think I'm glad y'all did that. We'll be bringing something forward to the council in the very near future about that subject. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Carroll? Thank you, Brett. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Council, back to you. We got to do it. I don't see any way around it. So. <laughs> One to our electricity. The first thing we'll need is a motion to waive the second, third reading, if y'all so mm -hmm. desire. Second. We have a motion to second to waive the second and third readings for this ordinance. Uh, any other discussion? Garrett. Say aye. 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 Passes seven to zero. Before adoption of the ordinance. Second. second. I have a motion and second to adopt this ordinance. Any further discussion? I'll just make one more point. Brett, you summed up very concisely um, how the relationship works. We are the one that actually approves the rates. And everyone needs to know we don't take something like this like, lightly. Um, as I told you before, also, the fact that Cohen Corporation does such a wonderful job day in and day out, and not only in emergency situations, as we just saw, but the fact that you guys do such a wonderful job uh, makes it easier to um, support when you need something like this. And so thank you for your uh, continued good work. And um, yes, I'm all in favor of this. One of the reasons Conway is, one of the, is the fastest growing city in the state and one of them in the nation plays right back to Conway Corporation and the job y'all have done. And, and uh, that does not go unnoticed. And we appreciate that. And our, uh, their engineering department and our transportation department work well. I think uh, the, the citizens, you should be able to see that uh, that we're working hard to replace, Conway Corporation is working hard to replace their underground infrastructure at the same time we're doing street work. And that's something that has not gone on for many years, but we've been doing it for the last six years and it's worked very well. So anyway, council, uh, we have a motion and a second. There's no further discussion. Mr. Garrett. Ledbetter. Yes. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. Mel. Aye. Ms. Webb. Aye. Ms. Tucker. Yes. Mr. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Yes. That passes seven to zero.